Welcome to the CanMed Coffee Talk podcast, where we talk with the leading minds in cannabis science, medicine, cultivation, and safety testing. I am your host, Ben Amaralt, the marketing manager at Medicinal Genomics and proud member of the team that puts on the CanMed conference every year. Head over to CanMedEvents.com now to learn all about our CanMed 2021 event that will take place April 12th through 14th at the Pasadena Convention Center in Pasadena, California. And get your tickets today at our special early bird rate. In other news, we've started a Facebook group. Each year we are consistently blown away by the amazing presentations, inspiring conversations, and important connections that are made at the annual CanMed conference. So we decided to keep the conversations flowing online with our CanMed community group. The CanMed community is our virtual forum, allowing you to interact directly with many of the CanMed conference speakers, past attendees, and other group members to discuss all things cannabis from bench to the bedside. Use the link in the show description to visit that group today and join. This episode's guest is Hope Jones. She is the CEO of Superior Finos LLC a hemp young plant production company in Arizona. She's also CEO of Emergent Cannabis Sciences, an international cannabis and micropropagation consulting company with clients in Colombia, Australia, Germany, and Canada. Hope has deep expertise in both hemp and cannabis, often serving as an expert consultant on forming policy at the state and federal levels. NASA also tapped her micropropagation expertise to develop programs for growing plants on deep space missions. In our conversation, we talked a lot about tissue culture, as Hope will be leading a panel on the topic at CanMed 2021. We covered how cultivators use tissue culture to remediate plants that are infected with pathogens such as powdery mildew and hop latent viroid, how the COVID-19 pandemic has actually made Hope's conversations with cultivators about plant viruses and pathogens much easier, how tissue culture can produce changes to the plant's DNA, why alcohol is not an effective antiviral solution for plants, how cryogenic storage of tissue cultured mother plants can be used as an insurance policy against pathogen infection or other disasters, and much more. Before we get to that conversation, I want to thank this episode's sponsor, Medicinal Genomics. Medicinal Genomics uses its unmatched knowledge into the cannabis genome and the microbes that impact cannabis plants to create a diverse set of testing solutions that improve crop yield, accelerate breeding, and ensure product safety. Many of the top cannabis testing labs trust MGC's PathoSeq microbial safety testing platform to test for state-mandated microbial targets, making it the industry's preferred microbial testing method. Now, labs and cultivators can use the new PathoSeq Cannabis Virus Multiplex Assay to test plants for hop latent viroid, lettuce chlorosis virus, and cannabis cryptic virus in a single PCR reaction. Learn more at medicinalgenomics.com. And it wouldn't be the CanMed Coffee Talk podcast without some good coffee. And for that, we always turn to the Hemp and Coffee Exchange. If you don't know, Hemp Coffee is a healthy, delicious, natural product, rich in trace minerals and nutrients, providing sustained energy without the crash of regular coffee. For more information, check out HempCoffeeExchange.com and use the promo code DRINKHEMP to get 10% off your purchase. Okay. And without any further ado, I give you my conversation with Hope Jones. Good afternoon, Hope. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Ben. All right. So tissue culture. Very excited to talk with you about this. And... Um, Our audience may already be familiar with tissue culture because I did speak with Mark Jordan in a previous episode and we discussed tissue culture and mostly around sort of how it's performed and the different stages of tissue culture and how the whole process works. Um, But for this conversation, I'd really like to talk with you about how tissue culture can actually be applied 
um, in cannabis and hemp cultivation. So maybe a good place to start is, can you tell me how widely used is tissue culture in cannabis and hemp? So tissue culture is widely used in in practice when it comes to regular, I say regular with quotes, um, regular agriculture, horticulture. Um, when I started doing cannabis tissue culture, I, I realized nobody's doing this. And if we're doing a lot of cloning, it makes sense. And then I will, I'm sure, get into all the other advantages um, to tissue culture. But it, it was actually a pretty shocking um, but then not surprising once I thought about it, that nobody in the cannabis or hemp industry had 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 been um, approaching that, at least not at any kind of real commercial scale that I had seen. And so it makes sense, uh, given the nature of the cannabis industry having to be underground for so long. How, how are you to actually even think about doing something along those lines? So it made sense to me when I thought about it, of course. And I thought, well, I have an opportunity to contribute uh, to this industry. Um, so I just, oh, I parked myself. I feel at home and, and I'm happy to, to help the industry understand what it can do, what its potential benefits are, and, you know, really there are cons that come along with it as well. So I, I'm sure we'll get to all that. Excellent. All right. Well, let's start with the pros. What are some reasons that cultivators should be using tissue culture? So I think probably the most common, commonly understood would be the idea that you can um, produce a lot of clones in a very small amount of space. And that is true, um, and and that's exciting. So the fact that you can take one cut um, that ha that and that cut should have a node, obviously, and we can either culture that node or we can culture the very tip of that node. We call the meristematic um, cells up there. Um, but either way, you can just take a part of a plant and you can plate it onto um, tissue culture uh, tissue culture media and the media has everything a growing plant needs for growth development um, vitamins the obvious elements and and hormones and we can do that in a small think of a baby food jar or deli cups um, about that size you can have multiple plants in each one of those vessels uh, or each one of um, our cuttings in 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 one of those vessels and if you have um, good, healthy stock in those vessels, then you're off to the races. And so it really comes down to the, um, the IP of the nutrient um, that's within that media on what your actual multiplication rate can be. But on average, let's just, let's say at least two to four X. So one cut gives you two or four additional plants um, uh, after about four weeks is the way we think about it. So I think that's probably the the most um, popularized understanding of, of, of tissue culture for any plant. Um, in cannabis in particular, to me, the reason why I do it is because we are dealing with a plant that was grown underground for, for obviously, <laughs> decades and decades and decades. Um, and bred for one thing only, and that was not disease resistance. It was bred for obviously cannabinoid um, production and, and, and high THC in particular. So we have plants that are pretty weak to environmental stresses and, and diseases that come along with it. And so tissue culture um, allows us to try to eradicate those diseases and generate stock and a lot of it, as I, as I was explaining, and, and when done right and um, using testing to, to verify, we, we should be able to produce a lot of clones that don't have known diseases. And that's really why I, why I do it, because we're dealing with, I think, um, an epidemic when it comes to diseases, because we do have some, you know, uh, a very a focused um, a breeding for so long that it's going to take a while for these breeders. Um, and there's a lot of great ones out there uh, busy working and, and, and doing this to generate more strains that are, that are um, resistant to various um, environmental stresses and diseases. So that's really interesting that you, you mention um, 
pathogens and diseases that are affecting the plant. Um, coincidentally, here at Medicinal Genomics, um, we're developing an assay. Actually, we just released an assay um, to test for viruses within the plant, mostly poplatin viroid, lotus chlorosis virus, and cannabis cryptic virus. And I'll, I'll say the response that we've gotten from the cultivator community around those assays has been very strong, mm-hmm. um, which seems to jive with what you were just saying, that there seems to be a bit of an epidemic when it comes to um, diseases among the cannabis plants. So it's very interesting that you say uh, that you say that just because um, we've been experiencing that ourselves, too. So so maybe that's a good uh, place good um, topic to get into. And as far as how can tissue culture be used to remediate plants that maybe are showing some signs of infection? So, um, yeah, I I love your guys' company. I love companies like yours because um, we need the ability to be able to test and there's not enough companies out there doing it. And so the cost of it is still really high um, because of that. And many people are still becoming educated about the process of testing and how frequently to do it. So I think uh, the more that companies like yourself, others, um, uh, consultants and nurseries like myself who are um, out there, you know, um, helping these uh, cultivators be able to uh, produce um, and, 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 and produce on margins that are getting smaller and smaller, we must have the ability to be able to test and then we must be able to do something about it once we find out, let's just get to one of the big ones, the hop latent viroid, for example, right? Um, so once you get that sucker, what the hell are we gonna do? And so um, with, with plant tissue cultures, so, so the strawberry industry is a really good example. Strawberries are very susceptible to various um, pathogens and and viruses and viroids. And I'm just going to use disease as a generic term that is every kind of uh, fungal, bacterial, virus, viroid as a generic, and then um, probably just use hop latent viroid for the sake of our conversation for something as a specific example when it comes to one of those. Um, But strawberry is really susceptible to, to disease. And so what they have done is they have generated clean stock. And this is because uh, using uh, plant tissue culture, and since um, uh, Mark had previously discussed how, you know, the various stages to go through that, but once you go through those stages, so I'm not going to go back over it, but once you go through those various stages, well, we can keep testing and it doesn't take a big sample size to do that. We don't need to flower the plant out. We don't even need to take it out of its vessel. We can continue to test throughout the process. So um, the, 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 what do we do once we know that we have it? So uh, here's, here's a common a uh, day in the life of, of Hope Jones, um, I get a call from a particular company who's really struggling with yields. And let's let's just say they used to have their favorite strain um, and it used to produce yields and uh, that and, and percentages. And, and now this strain is no longer doing that. Well, because just like with COVID out, out for us in our pandemic, well, plants also get um, viruses and viroids. And so with like the hop latent viroid, you have to know what the symptoms are to be able to identify it. Well, we have a problem because obviously there's not enough understanding out there within these companies to, to A, know what the symptoms necessarily are until um, oftentimes it's too late. And so when I show up at somebody's facility, I've seen these symptoms now for so long that I'm just, ah, you know, I put my hands in my pockets. <laughs> I'm not touching anything. I don't want to tour anymore. I know exactly what I'm dealing with. And the reason why I do that is because these diseases almost every single time are very easily transmitted by us, right? So uh, we call that, um, you know, mechanical or, or um, yeah, mechanical transmission. And so I can take a plant from their facility and, um, uh, my R and D lab in Arizona is 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 hemp, and so I'm I'm taking a hemp plant from somebody's facility back to my lab, and I'm working with taking cuts from this plant. I'm sending it to a third party lab for testing and identification of these diseases, so I always know what I'm looking at. But now I'm going to start the process of trying to dissect the smallest parts of that plant that I can that will survive in tissue culture, and oftentimes um, that's that's that meristematic cells. Well, why do I, why do we do that? Well, we know from um, 
decades and decades of research in other plants that have um, th these various diseases. And the reason why this is this particular disease is hop latent viroid is it was originally identified in hops. Closely related um, plant to us makes a lot of secondary metabolites just like our plants do, has resin glands just like ours. So that's a pretty good place to, to study. And so just like we see reduction in yields, well, so do the hop growers. They were seeing, you know, um, in papers back into the early 80s when it was uh, really identified and characterized, you know, reductions in, in um, oil production by up to 40%, uh, fewer lateral branching, and which, you know, that's going to give you less biomass, all of these problems, right? And so very similar to what we're seeing, plus we've had companies out there identify um, and characterize the hop latent viroids. So if I can take the smallest piece possible and if I can learn from these other plants um, species where the highest density of, of these particular particles are in the plant, well, I'm going to try to avoid taking cuttings from that part of the plant. And I'm going to try to go and, and, and you know, it's theorized anyway that um, hop latent viroids seems to really um, populate in the roots in the base of the plants. And so is that true in cannabis? It's it's yet to be totally characterized and determined. So, but I'm going to actually say I'm going to go for the tips anyway. Um, and I'm going to take as the healthiest tips that I can. And I'm going to take those meristematic cells and why the meristem instead of the node. Um, I'm going to do that is because a lot of these diseases have a tendency to localize and travel through the plant in the vascular system. Conveniently, the meristematic cells are not connected to the vascular system. So we carefully excise that, um, those meristematic cells from the rest of the plant. We may be able to um, rescue tissue that does not harbor any of that disease or those viroid particles. So that's the idea, and that's how it's been done in, in, in so many other plant species. Um, strawberries turn this into a very um, uh, feasible um, uh, um, process, and it's still commercially viable, right? And so I'm going to use a model out there that and approach that with cannabis in the same way, because that's an industry that's focused on um, providing in their industries and in, in any industry, but cannabis certified stock that is disease free, or at least free of the disease that they're um, specifically testing for. So we can't do that. And, and we don't, we should be able to do that, but there's just not a system set up to do that. But if you are working with plant tissue culture companies, um, those would be the things that I would ask. What are you testing for? How are you going about that process? How can you be sure um, that when I get it, that it doesn't have that particular virus or viroid or whatever your problem is. But that's our approach. That's why we do it. And financially, if we get to a point where we're constantly dealing with this, like they have with a hop latent viroid and, and other viruses in, in the hop industry, just to you know continue with that example, they've been dealing with this for 30 years of research and they've yet to eradicate it. And they're seeing they and the reason why they spent all of that time and put in you know decades and decades of research is because it affects the bottom line. Yes, it affects the taste and the bitterness and all of that um, that comes about those secondary metabolites that are produced, like those alpha acids that that's being used. But we're seeing those reductions too, right? And so that hurts, and we cannot continue down that road. So we've got to try to attack um, this problem from multiple approaches, and tissue culture is but one. Now it sounds like tissue culture is really used when you know a problem has been identified, and you're trying to kind of salvage the plant. But can it be used sort of proactively as your propagation technique, and will that always produce something that's that's clean? It should, if it's done right, if, if, if the individuals that are doing the, the plant tissue culture are, are tracking their, their rounds of multiplication, if there's more, um, you know, if the ability to use molecular markers allows us to make sure we're not getting DNA variants, which can happen, um, that would be wonderful. But at least we know the chemical profiles and if the plants that are being produced are still producing the expected chemical profiles because... Again, the goal is to produce a clone, not to produce a variant. Um, and so, yeah, we should be able to produce. Um, that's why that you see more nurseries, uh, tissue culture nurseries coming about, 
because there's no reason in the world why we should not be able to produce clones um, at a commercial scale. There's a cost um, that comes with it, but anything in our industry comes with certain costs and it's not for everybody, but you don't necessarily have to be good at everything if there's nurseries and if there's options for, um, you know, being able to purchase that from, from neighboring uh, companies. Absolutely. So you mentioned DNA variants, which stuck out to me because again, <laughs> here at Medicinal Genomics, we do, we do a little sequencing work on cannabis yeah. as well. So I'm curious, um, so what sort of variations can you see uh, as a result from tissue culture? So, you know, what we can see in, in cannabis, we're going to have to just compare to other plant species that that's been very well characterized in the literature. Um, even those companies, you know, like myself and other good companies around uh, the country and Canada or through other places in the world are doing amazing research, but they don't always publish that. And so it's going to be a long time before we know all the types of DNA variants. But in, in many other plant species, it's known that you can get... Um, if it's not, if you're, if you're not approaching your tissue culture correctly, if, if you want to maintain clones, but you're, you're doing something and your media is not right, or you end up getting what's called a lot of callus cells, those are undifferentiated cells that develop. What happens when a plant um, uh, forms a bunch of undifferentiated cells is that, well, they're not actually... Um, signaled to do anything yet. So they, they're not signaled to be a stem. They're not necessarily signaled to be a root. They're not necessarily signaled to be, uh, you know, uh, a leaf or another node. They're just there, which means if any kind of signal or, or, or change happens, well, it's going to go with it. And so I'm being oversimpli uh, kind of oversimplifying the idea, but you can get a lot of what's called DNA off types or DNA variants that happen from that, where each cell out of that puddle or pile of callus cells can, can have a different expression. Is it because of an actual genetic change, something that happened to the chromosome? Well, it depends on what the stressor was. If there was something to cause DNA damage, um, that can absolutely happen just during normal rounds of replica DNA replication as a cell divides, you can get um, DNA replication errors. So that definitely happens. And if you then propagate those cells up into new um, shoot material, and then you're um, putting it on a different media to get roots, well then now you're gonna see different expressions potentially, depending on what those genetic changes were. Not everything's always um, visual, but oftentimes they can be. And so that's just one example. And when you have a pile of cells and callus cells that are all undifferentiated, you can have millions of cells depending on, on, on how many cells are there, right? So they're very small. And so you can imagine that you now have just in the size of like a dime, potentially cells that could have a bunch of different genotypes. And if it's not DNA, actual something that's modifying the DNA, you might see epigenetic changes. So epigenetic changes can are, are things that happen over time due to um, some sort of environmental cue that causes the a cell that it might have a localized response or it might have a systemic response, right? And if, if a plant is constantly getting some sort of um, uh, signal, because they can't move, right? So they have to adapt to their environment. And so they're going to, these, these signals can then all of a sudden induce a regulatory pathway, upregulation, downregulation, what have you. And, and those when, can, can also happen in a bunch of callus cells. And so you're going to see different uh, epigenetic effects. And I think one way I like to think about it, um, where, where, I, where my lab's at, I don't know what the hell, but this parking lot, everybody, the, there's one way to you know drive down and park your car, but for some reason, people like to drive the other way, right? And so that now causes me every single time I'm leaving my, you know, getting in my truck to, you know, not, you, you, you don't assume anymore and you're constantly looking on both directions and going slow because it's a busy parking lot. Whereas if you were in a different environment, you would have never had that signal so you would never be really hypersensitive to having to do that you know i i think um you can imagine how if you had a bunch of cells that all of a sudden had some sort of signal 
changes in chromosome structure, different um, DNA or RNA methylation patterns are happening. And now you can check out a library book that you never had access to. And now you're getting a different expression. So it, it can also be used for good. It doesn't, it just means why are we doing it? How are we approaching it? Do we want clonal production or actually do we want to kind of get into that R&D side of stuff? It depends. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, I understand the, uh, the epigenetic part of it, and um, I know that that can even happen um, with clones, like in traditional cloning. But um, are you saying, though, that uh, with tissue culture, there can actually be actual changes to the DNA sequence, or is it more of an epigenetic sort of response? Both. 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 Um, wow, that's it, interesting. You know, again, are there papers out there in cannabis um, that have done... Uh, uh, canvas tissue culture that have looked at molecular markers. Actually, thankfully, there are a few papers out there and there's um, only going to be more and more coming. So we do have molecular markers like 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 your company is actually a, a great resource to be able to 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 start um, utilizing the power of what a molecular marker can do for us. Right. So we can not only um, the ability to sequence something so we can see if there's been major um, genetic changes we can also look at molecular markers to see if we're having amplification of something or if it's completely disappeared. And it is known in other plant species, yes, both actual changes to DNA can happen and epigenetic changes. If, if, and, and because of all that, you know, decades and decades of research, most of us in the cannabis tissue culture uh, industry know that. And we are cognitive of if, even if we don't have molecular markers or sequencing everything, is is there are there logical approaches that we can take to mitigate that or re, you know try to mitigate that risk? There are because of all those decades of research in in other plant species, and so um, it's careful selection of your medias. It's 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 looking for those that callus um, those callus formations um, uh, you know at the base of of your nodal plants um, as you're doing your tissue culture, for example, not not doing callus unless you really want to. So there are approaches that are, um, you know, well described and at least we have a logical way to approach it. And then ideally after uh, plants gone through culture that you, even if you're not sequencing it, you should be flower, you know, we obviously want to flower it out, make sure it still has the same chemical profile because clonal tissue culture should not change what its DNA potential, what its genetic potential should be. It shouldn't be introducing, you know, genes for limonene, for example, to create new terpenes unless, but unless that plant actually already had the genetic code to be able to produce that um, particular um, compound. So you do the um, flowering out, you look for um, the chemical profile, but you also look for the architecture and the, the habit of, of this particular strain. So if it's a strain that you know very well, you know likely what its growth habit is and you know what its chemical profile should be and it should be performing um, pretty damn well compared to what, what, what you started with um, before you gave it um, a, a, a tissue culture bath, shall we say. No, that's really fascinating. And at the risk of <laughs> the risk of plugging medicinal genomics yet again, um, we recently came out with a, a SNP chip, um, which is sort of a more cost effective way to to get some sequencing information on the plant without having to do, you know, full on sequencing. It's more of a, a SNP panel. And I wonder if a tool like that would be useful for tissue culture um, just to, you know, screen against the original plant to just make sure that there's no um, differentiation between the, the SNPs that are being called. My God, man. Yes. The simple answer is just, yes. Um, you know, I think any of us doing plant tissue culture would love to be able to, to utilize tools like that, uh, whether with a, a third party and sending it off or in house, but just, yes, um, absolutely. And um, my, my favorite my favorite R and D and thing to do in this industry is to be working with breeders and and other growers on 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 a a breeder spending a lot of time the good breeders um, to generate these new genetics right and so they should be rewarded for that 
I want to be able to, to get their, their genetics out in the marketplace, and they should be able to feel confident when their genetics are in the marketplace that their genetics are in fact true to type, um, that they are optimal. So then that way there's, um, there's, there's accountability on, on all ends that a, the, we get to, we get to choose we're, we're, you know, we are the consumers, right? We get to choose what we buy, who we do business with. And, and, and all of that comes down to why would we want to do that? And, and, and to me, I would want to do business with somebody who was in fact utilizing tools like you were just describing and then working with breeders to be able to protect the integrity of their genetics, but also be able to pr protect their genetics, right? So if they wanted to validate or if they want, if there was a dispute about genetics, you know, um, it's, it's been a long time for these breeders to be able to say, okay, I, I spent years, you know, generating this particular strain, my, my God, you know, the fact that it can just get out there should be a choice for them to make, not just because somebody can just take it. And in horticulture and agriculture, if you see, a, you know, the hot new, um, you know, rose that's out on the market and there's a always a tag that goes along with it. The reason why there's a tag is because those companies that generated those particular um, um, cultivars are those are getting paid, right? There's a royalty that goes with that. And if some company ends up selling that particular rose um, without the proper licensing rights, well then, A, obviously um, you have the ability to use markers or SNPs and sequencing to be able to, um, you know, to enforce your um, trademark patent or whatever it might be. But then if somebody is actually growing something of yours as well, you want to make sure that whoever is selling that product or representing that product on your behalf is doing it in the right way. And using markers, for example, or just understanding the genome is a good way to actually have the best understanding of in this environment, the plant when grown under these conditions with these substrates, with this nutrient solution. So when you buy something, again, from a nursery, it typically comes with those climate, light, and other requirements because if somebody's growing something of yours and they're just, excuse my language, but they're just a shitty grower, well, that represents that. I mean, it's a reflection of their brand potentially, right? And so all of these tools can be used for all aspects of our industry. It's just pretty complicated right now um, as our industry is still very young. Absolutely. And that's a common, <laughs> common refrain in a lot of these conversations I'm having with folks is that, you know, the industry has a lot of learning to do, has a lot of growing up to do. We have a lot to learn, <laughs> um, which is and exciting. It, and right? I mean, it's, it's like, bring it. We get to be at that point. And it, it's such a, you know, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to be a part of a, a brand new industry and something that's so huge. Awesome. <laughs> Definitely. And that's why we love doing doing CanMed as well, to bring all these people together from the different facets of the the industry, whether it be cultivation or safety testing or even the healthcare professionals who are using the medicine uh, to treat patients too, um, yeah. to really learn from each other and kind of see where we can help each other and move this whole thing forward. So that's what's exciting. Yeah. And, and you guys are really great at doing that and for the education of everybody, because we all do want to learn, right? We, we we don't want to stay small, shitty growers forever or, or <laughs> struggling with a lot of stuff. This is not why we do this. So it's awesome. I mean, you guys are really, really um, important uh, avenues for this. And so we talked about how to use maybe tissue culture to remediate plants that are infected with pathogens. But I do know that your company, um, Emerging Cannabis Sciences, you also work with integrated pest management systems to sort of maybe prevent things like this from happening. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a bit to that and kind of how that can be used in, in cannabis in hemp oh, cultivation. It's the most important acronym of my life, IPM. Um, <laughs> integrated <laughs> pest management. Um, it is the most important um, thing in any cannabis company. And I don't care if you're a company that only does retail because you can't have a retail operation if you don't have any product to put in the shelves. And if you don't actually care about the product on your shelf, you know, people are going to get wise and they're going to shop elsewhere. Right. I mean, we want good quality 
predictable product. And the only way to do that is actually to be aware of all your cultural practices. And it, the the IPM um, is absolutely critical. It's it's about um, first of all the genetics as soon as they are coming into your your facility. I think one of the biggest mistakes that I see, um, and I love seeing like the easy light bulb moment, is like everything must go into quarantine, right? So that's not a pesticide. So integrated pest management isn't only about pesticides or scouting and looking for actual insects. It is about how to mitigate that risk in general. You'll always have problems as a grower. What can we do to mitigate our risk? And so it starts with as soon as you have genetics coming into your facility as clones, or if you're popping seeds, you've got to have some sort of place to be able to isolate those plants until you have an understanding of it, their health status before you introduce them into your you know, mother population. And to me, that's probably the number one thing that most companies don't they may think about it, or maybe they're not um, sure how to go about it. And it does take space out of your growing and, you know, um, uh, square footage. And, and so a lot of times nobody necessarily wants to do that. And so, but it has to be done because almost, well, ev everything that I see in cannabis when it comes to any disease um, happens through mechanical transmission. And if you are bringing in... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I take in people's problems for a living. So I'll, I'll you know, get um, hemp genetics and I'm opening up a, a, literally a mite bomb, right? Because I'm getting these, these cuts and then I'm, we're checking them in, which is another thing that I, is really critical um, for uh, IPM uh, strategy. What I mean by checking them in, well, I'm physically looking at the damn thing before I, you know, just throw it in a population. I, I have a, uh, it doesn't, you don't have to have something crazy expensive, just a, a microscope that allows you to be able to see things like russet mites and small eggs. Um, but yeah, so you're I'm opening up and it's just like, oh, russet mites, right? So what am I going to do? Am I going to just throw that into my population? No, I, I now then have to have the next step. What do I do for all incoming plants? I need to be able to isolate it. I need to have a strategy for any, uh, what pesticides I can use in my state what I should be using, what I what I shouldn't be using, and then immediately make sure that my staff is appropriately trained to be able to handle and, and do all of that. And then follow it up with a specific regime. So this is, again, all independent of tissue culture, but I do the same thing in my own lab. So I'll have... Um, um, grow tents. And I actually, you know, those disposable gowns in hospitals, the yellow ones that you see everybody wearing all the time. Sure. So I'll actually take that and I'll, I'll, on the inside, I'll duct tape that around any orifice of the tent, right? So because I don't want anything to get in and I don't want anything to get out. If that's all we can do, then that's all we can do, but at least we're doing something. And then um, only certain people can go in and out. And then I'm only putting something into my um, general population, once I know I'm not introducing a mite bomb to the rest of the other moms, because guess what's going to happen? And, and, and the mothers are the most important, most valuable thing in any company, because if something happens to your mothers, if we don't quickly, quickly identify, which means you have to train your staff on what to look for, and then immediately get rid of it. Yes, it might be the last one of that strain, but if it has a virus or a viroid, unless you're going to immediately remove it and put it in your tissue culture facility or to another tissue culture company, you will spread that disease. You absolutely will. So why fuck around? Let's get rid of it. Let's move it out. And yes, you're going to have to source another genetic if that's your last one, but it's either that or it's going to be, you know, within probably the, you know, six months to the next two years you know, you can expect to see a significant decrease in your yields over time. So paying staff to, to, to be vigilant about identifying it, um, purchasing clean stock from companies that actually can provide a different type of COA is another thing um, that I think is really critical for us all to become educated and get um, in the habit of asking about. We know how to ask for COAs when it comes to chemical profiles or 
compliance for state, but there are agriculture laboratories and companies like you that do this testing and work with companies like mine that say, okay, I'm doing this process when it leaves my hands. Here's the test report that shows at least when I tested it for these particular diseases, it was negative. So, you know, at that point, can we say disease free or virus free? Well, at least when it's leaving my hands, according to the COA, um, it appears that it's, it's testing negative. I think we all need to understand that we should start asking for that because I don't want to bring anything into my house unless I know that at least that bare minimum um, has been done, um, especially since I'm oftentimes spending a hell of a lot of money for these genetics, right? Um, so, so I think, um, and then just it's, you've got to have a sanitation process and, and, and there's so many good resources about how to do IPM scouting, why you would want to do that. And then consultants like myself and many other consultants around the country, this is what we do. We help train your teams. We help bring that method in. Um, and then it's just a learn curve. It's just like, yeah, nobody likes to wear a mask, but you know, I don't think about it anymore, but I can't tell you at the beginning how many times I'd have to turn around at, right before I get to the, <laughs> the door of the damn store because I left a mask in my car, right? But I don't do that anymore. So it will take some time and it has to be accepted and practiced and, and prioritized from the top down because if somebody doesn't want to pay for testing, are you going to throw that plan away? If somebody, you know, if, if the boss is like, oh my God, that's my strain, blah, blah, blah. Well, okay, but what do you want me to do with it as the grower, right? And if your boss is telling you to keep it and you have no place to put it, this is how these companies are getting themselves into trouble. And so I think there's a few things to learn. And then there's just the cultural practices that uh, there's so many re great resources out there, companies and consultants to help you if, if just get you over the hump. Yeah, and you and you mentioned masks and sort of this whole shared pandemic experience that we're all going through. And I wonder if if cultivators and growers will be more aware of potential infestations, whether it be from viruses or pests or anything like that. Sort of because we're all going through this experience, and it's it's been so top of mind. And maybe you're already seeing that. Are you seeing that cultivators are being much more cognizant of you know potential infections? You know, it's a really good question. I will tell you um, the immediate thing that I have noticed is I don't have to explain as much. People, it's get it now <laughs> that plants <laughs> can get virus um, because when I started giving these um, talks. It really actually took like a year before people would believe, truly believe that plants can get a virus or a viroid. And so I was like, oh my God, yes, it can. <laughs> um, and again, that was just because why would they need to know that before? Um, so anyway, so, and then the idea of like, okay, these cultural practices of wearing gloves. Um, so when I started in the industry a little over five years ago, I was working for a company and they still, when they were doing the pinching, they were still doing that with their thumbnail with no gloves. And I was like, why, why would you do that? <laughs> um, because, it, you know, having had the experience of working with, with, with plant diseases, I mean, it's just, I would never get in a million years think to do that, but that's because I've gone through it. And this company hadn't gone through that yet. So yeah, everybody, we put PPE stations. And, and the first thing I do for most of my consultants is where are your PPE stations? So the uh, protective um, uh, supplies that we need, like gloves and, 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 the refills for your your bleach or your vercon for your shears and stuff that it's actually killing the virus because you can't use alcohol um little thing for everybody out there so where's all of those supplies mm. i call those the ppe stations well guess what i know how i am and if i have to get up to go get a new pair of gloves my god i'm not going to do it right make it easy for me make it easy for everybody just to be able to do it you don't want to have a box of gloves just at one door on the entry you want to have gloves and gloves of every size and have stations throughout your facility and then it become people will do it it's not like they don't want to do it it's just if you if it's not you know um you know, planned and, and actually done in a way that's going to be successful for people, then, you know, it gets to be a, to a point where it's like, oh, forget it. You know, I'm not going to, if I can't find anything, I'm going to use alcohol. At least I'm using alcohol. Um, well, that's the worst thing we want to do for a virus because unlike with people and we can use, you know, hand sanitizer and alcohol and you saw all that happened with 
the, the, the data in the literature is that alcohol is not really the most effective thing for, for plant uh, viruses or viroids. And that's why you've got to use the bleach and, and other products that have been tested and shown out there like Vircon that will work. You've got to leave that stuff out. You have to have it prepped up. You, I mean, just make it easy for everybody. And so uh, since the pandemic, it has been very easy for these companies to get it. They get it quickly <laughs> um, and they understand uh, mechanical transmission um, more now than I think uh, anybody would ever want to, unless you do what I do. Well, that's an interesting point about alcohol not being an effective um, sanitation method, maybe for lack of a better term, um, when it comes to plants. That's interesting. I didn't know that. It will work with a lot of other like fungal and um, bacterial um, 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 microbial contaminants. Um and, and I think a lot more needs to be done uh, to see what products out there are, in fact, effective against specific per or particular plant viruses or viroids. The reason why there's going to be a different mode of action is because we're talking about different kinds of things. So a DNA or an RNA molecule versus, you know, a single cell organism, right? <laughs> so there you can imagine you can understand thinking about it from that approach that different chemicals are going to have different effects on on, on those on, on those things so yeah the the much of the literature out there uh looking and at least studying things like uh tobacco mosaic viruses which is one of the worst things um to get because it's damn near impossible to eradicate even with plant tissue culture and it just mm -hmm. is persistent it i mean it will stay in you know, soil or water or, or I mean, it'll just stay there as, as, as a kind of a latent particle until it gets into a favorable environment and then off it goes again. Um, same with the hop latent viroid, right? Um, we don't quite understand the mechanism of, of A, its duration, how long, it, you know, is it viable for, what environmental parameters can really kill it, but there's still quite a bit of data out there to show it's a tough one. And when they did some studies in field trials, um, this was, gosh, I think back in the 80s and uh, over in Germany or the UK, they were looking at field studies of hop latent viroid and, and they were studying to see how they could treat the farm or the fields, right? So if you're planting this crop and think about the hop, uh, hemp farmers, if you're <laughs> planting seed that came from infected moms with a hop latent viroid and uh, the probability of those seeds being infected is really high. Well, that's going to be now in your soil. So now you have soil. Oh, <laughs> and there's no. a lot of marijuana growers out there too, outdoors and in the fields. So now you have in, in, your soil is in, at least infected with these um, viroid. What do you do? And so they were looking to see what chemicals and compounds that they could use, but also with the farm equipment, looking at uh, their blades during harvest and what they needed to do. And really, when it comes down to it, we're still looking at the same thing that we've known for a long time. And it comes down to bleach and a few other chemicals out there that are on the market. But 10% bleach, my friend, it's tough on the shears, but would you rather, you know, suffer with losing your moms and having to pay a bunch of companies to get uh, like myself to clean them up or buy, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars in new genetics more frequently um, than you would like or buy some shears every couple months. I, I think to me, the, the business um, answer there is pretty clear. So you mentioned that some viruses or viroids might be difficult to tissue culture out. Um, and one of the things I wanted to ask you about is I know I'm, I'm kind of vaguely familiar with the idea of, of keeping plants suspended in tissue culture as maybe like a preservation tactic. Um, could that be like a feasible strategy to sort of have a tissue culture of a mom kind of just in case that mom does get sick? Instead of trying to tissue culture something out, you could sort of create a new one out of clean stock. Is that, um, is that Absolutely. a strategy? Yeah. yeah, yeah, it is. And I have um, many customers that actually uh, do that because you don't want to keep you know, your, your entire library doesn't need to be, you know, living in, in your mother's space. So that's one advantage for doing that. Um, and you can, companies, uh, you know, when we do plant tissue culture, there's a couple ways that we can maintain that stock. Um, oh, with the fires too, or, or the hurricanes, right? If something just happens and, and everything's gone because, well, shit, I mean, everything that happened this past several years and this past year in particular is 
horrible. So if you lose everything and because you're just trying to save yourself um, uh, and you lose your genetics, what are you going to do? Well, um, we can, um, so we do this, and this is a service that we provide um, where we can um, do uh, seed um, banking. So we can do that in um, uh, liquid nitrogen. So there's gene banks, plant gene banks all over the world, and 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 they do this with liquid nitrogen. So just like you have, you've heard of, uh, you know, our for for stem cells and cell um, those kinds of banks, but plant banking is a very common thing. And we just have to do the R and D, and that's what I've spent the last several years actually, you know, fiddling around with in my lab here in Tempe, is 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 to actually work through that. Again, we start with kind of known stuff out in the literature that's worked and other similar plant species. And we just start things like, can we just keep it in like refrigerated like temperatures for a longer period of time than keeping it on the shelf and having to, you know, actively keep, you know, subculturing it every couple of months and media drying out and this kind of stuff. Yeah, we can. Can we actually preserve it in liquid nitrogen? So we call it, you know, cryopreservation. Um, as seed and tissue, absolutely. And so that's that's huge because again, if if, if you want to have, instead of limiting yourself to the number of strains in your library based off of square footage in your mom room, well, now it's a couple tubes in a doer tank or some shelf space in, in a walk-in cooler, um, or with nurseries and companies like myself. And so that, that I think those are all advantages uh, to the industry for, for tissue culture. Again, this is early days for companies um, that are doing this um, tissue culture and preservation. And it's just important to know they're not going to have all the answers just yet. And they're, they're the good company should tell you what they've done, what's still not necessarily done. Like, you know, I haven't been in business and, and and been able to pull tissue or seed out, you know, five years after being preserved in liquid nitrogen and check for viability. Nobody has. Right. So but companies should be open to have that dialogue with anybody who's interested in those services. And, and it should, I think, let the industry know that at least this is a company with some integrity in a, and, and we're all going to give it the best shot. But and also there's no research out there. Right. So like the hop industry, well, there's a hops industry associations where, you know, um, every, um, all poundage that's sold goes, a certain fraction of that goes into, uh, for research and development as an industry to pay for things for studying all of these viruses and viroids and other diseases and hops. We're so young as an industry, we have nothing like that. And so these companies like myself who are out there and, and are providing these services are doing it all on our own. And, and, Yes, it's going to take a little bit longer for that, but at least know that it's coming. And then companies like yours that are providing services. So I use the services all the time because I don't necessarily have the sequencing or being able to do the arrays within my own facility. Um, you know, I hope to grow up and one day and be able to have a lab like that too. And so um, it's just all a matter of time and baby spit. But at least there's more companies like ours that are out there providing the services and and as consumers of those um, products and services, we have to just learn to ask better questions and know what the pros, cons, and, and, and you know, yet to be determined are. And yet again, just another example of how, um, or just another example of sort of the value of everyone coming together at an annual event like a CanMed to, to share what we've, lear we've learned over the past year and, um, and continue to help each other sort of grow up and move this whole industry forward. So I think maybe that's a good place to start. I know that I've, I've kept you long over the the time that I, I promised I would keep you. And um, I promised I would have a lot to offer. So I, <laughs> no. I, I appreciate your patience and, and actually asking me to participate in this. Um, I really do. And I miss being in person, but we still have this and it's, it's something for us um, to be, you know, all night in the hood. Trust me, I'm listening to a lot of podcasts. <laughs> so, thank you for doing it. Absolutely. And thank you. And um, I look forward to seeing you out in Pasadena for CanMed. Heck yeah. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Hope Jones. Check out the links in the show description for more information about the topics we discussed. And thanks again to our sponsor, Medicinal Genomics. Our next episode will drop January 27th, 
In the meantime, please go to canmedevents.com slash coffee talk and sign up for email updates. That will enter you into a drawing to win two tickets to our CanMed 2021 VIP dinner and keep you up to date with all things CanMed 2021. If social media is your thing, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Just search for CanMed Events. And lastly, if you are listening via a podcast app, go ahead and hit the subscribe button so that new episodes automatically download to your device. And please leave us a five-star review as well. All right, that's it from us. As always, stay safe, stay healthy, and be sure to come back for the next episode of CanMed Coffee Talk.